At the very front of the Fallout 2 official strategy guide, we find a short document called The Vault Dweller's Memoirs. These memoirs are all we know about the canonical ending to the original Fallout. As it was written by the developers and published in this strategy guide, it is considered canon. Thanks to these memoirs, the original Vault Dweller is one of the few playable characters in the Fallout franchise for whom we have a lot of canonical information. We know his gender, and we know details like that he was married. The memoirs serve as a great introduction to Fallout 2, bridging the two games. And so for this episode, we'll read the memoirs, and then continue with The Book of Elders. The one good thing about growing old is that you get your way. The new leaders of the tribe, they refuse to call themselves elders until I have passed on, which should be soon if I'm lucky, want me to record my knowledge for future generations. Bah! What knowledge they need is to be found with sweat and blood, not some letters on a page. But the future is a great unknown, and they may have a point. To make them happy, I've written down what I feel will be important. The important words being, what I feel will be important. They want me to write my memoirs. Fine, I'll do it. But as the song goes, I'll do it my way. And I'm old enough that I'll get my way. Chapter 1. The War I know little about the war, but it doesn't really matter. A lot of people died when a lot of atomic bombs went off and nearly destroyed the world. If you don't know what an atomic bomb is, then imagine the worst thing possible. Atomic bombs were worse than that. Chapter 2. The Vaults Like all of the original members of the tribe, I came from the vaults. Before the war, the government of the United States, which numbered in the thousands of villages and had many, many tribesmen per village, paid to have these huge holes dug in mountains and huts of metal and stone built underground. There were many vaults, some were close to cities, and some were far away. These vaults were to be used as safe places in case of atomic war. As you may guess, when the war came, your ancestors made it to a vault, Vault 13 to be specific. For several generations, your ancestors and mine lived within the vault. As best as they could figure, it was too dangerous to try and leave the vault. They grew their own food, recycled their waste, read, worked, slept, and had families, and even purified the necessary water within the vault. I was born in the creche and was raised by the community and a robot. It was a good life, but all good things come to an end. About three generations after the war, the water purification ship the vault relied on to create fresh water broke down. All the spare parts were missing or busted, and without the water chip, the vault was doomed. Something had to be done. The overseer gathered the healthy of us between a certain age and made us draw straws. Guess what? I drew the short one. Wouldn't be much of a story if I didn't, would it? I left the vault the next day. Chapter 3. Life on the Outside My first few days were harrowing, to say the least. I fought off some giant mutant rats that were more interested in eating me than they should have been. My only clue was the location of another vault, number 15. I spent a couple days stumbling through the desert before I came upon a small settlement. I stopped there for help and encountered the little town called Shady Sands. I helped them, and they helped me. Understand that survival requires that you work together, even with people you may not trust. I did earn the trust, however, of two prominent citizens of Shady Sands, Tandy and her father, Eridesh. With their knowledge and the help of a man called Ian, I continued on my way to Vault 15. The ruins of Vault 15, to be more specific, ravaged by the elements, scavengers, and time itself, Vault 15 was no help for my people. The control room that contained their water chip was buried under tons of fallen rock, and I had to move on. After a small problem with some raiders, who would continue for years to plague not only myself but the tribe, I found myself in Junktown. It was here that I learned the most important rule of all. Doing a good thing sometimes means being a very bad person. My memories of Junktown are tainted, and I feel no remorse for my actions in that place. It was there that I came across a dog, who adopted me and was my faithful friend from there on. I miss dog meat to this day. 
While Junktown was a city of traders and traitors, it did not have a water chip. I was not desperate yet, as there was still some time for me to recover the chip and return to my home, but I needed to move on. Fortunately, they pointed me in the direction of the Hub, the largest city in the wasteland. The Hub was a larger city than both Junktown and Shady Sands combined. You could drop the vault in there and you probably wouldn't notice. But the people of the Hub had no life, and it was a desolate place just the same. It eased my mind, however, to hire some merchants to bring water to the vault. Looking back, it was probably a mistake to do so. But I was still innocent of the evils that lurked through the ruins of a civilization. A small clue led me to the city of the ghouls, the place they called Necropolis. It was there that I encountered large mutants armed with weapons of an unknown origin. It is with heavy sadness that I say that Ian lost his life in the city of the dead. A super mutant burned him to death with a flamethrower. The passage of time is no proof against the memory of burning flesh. His sacrifice was not in vain, as I did find the water chip buried beneath the city. It was with easier steps that I returned to Vault 13. Chapter 4 Enemies of the State While the Overseer was obviously happy to see me return to the vault, alive and with the necessary water chip, he was distraught at my description of the super mutants. It is here that I realized the mistake I had made with the water merchants. I had pointed them and others in the direction of our home. Without the protection of anonymity, the vault could easily have been destroyed. The knowledge of the fate of Vault 15 did not help. The Overseer tasked me with a new mission. Find and destroy the danger of the super mutants. Once again, I left the vault. This time, it was easier on my heart. Looking back on it now, I realize it was also the first time I should have seen the true hearts of the other vault dwellers and the Overseer. I returned to the hub looking for clues. I spent some time there, and I discovered a shady underworld amongst the hustle and bustle of that large city. They thought they could manipulate me, but I proved them wrong and used the crooks instead. I did rescue a young man who belonged to the Brotherhood of Steel. A few troublemakers tried to stop me, but I learned much about survival since leaving the vault. It was in my best interest to leave town for a while. I journeyed to this Brotherhood. Thinking they would have the knowledge that I sought, I tried to join them. They required me to go on a quest before they would let me in. Thinking it would be a short and easy quest, I agreed and set off for a place they called the Glow. The horror of Atomic War was never so obvious to me until then. The Brotherhood was surprised to see me, and even more surprised to see that I had not only survived their quest, but succeeded. They gave me the information I required and some of their technology, and I set off in search of the Boneyard. On my way, I took a detour and stopped by the necropolis in order to see some old friends. Unfortunately, that place was now truly the city of the dead. All the ghouls had been slaughtered. Large mutants roamed the streets. I found one survivor who told me that the mutants had attacked shortly after I had left, but he died. The ghoul told me that the mutants were looking for pure strain humans, and one in particular. The ghoul's description of the mutant's special target fit me perfectly. It was with a heavy heart and a cold burning on my soul that I continued on to Boneyard. Chapter 5. The Master The city of Los Angeles must have been the largest in the world before the war. The L.A. Boneyard stretched forever, the skeletons of buildings lying under the hot sun. Not even the wind entered this dead city. I found many enemies and a few friends in the boneyard. I killed when necessary and learned more about the nature of my true foes. Deep under the ground, I found an evil that was behind the mutants and their army. Within a dark and forbidding vault, where the walls dripped with human flesh and the screams of the dying echoed through the halls, I found many evil creatures and mutants. Walking among the misshapen ones, I killed one of their servants and took his clothing. Hidden from casual searches, I made my way to the bottom of the vault. The deeper into the vault I went, the more gruesome the journey. More and more flesh was to be found, integrated into the very walls. The worst part of it was that the flesh was still alive and even aware of my presence. 
After a while, I found myself in the presence of the most hideous sight yet. I still cannot bring myself to write of this discovery, but let it be known that when I left, the beast was dead and the master of the mutant army was no more. Chapter 6 The Vats My job was still not finished, for I had one task remaining. The master had literally built his army one mutant at a time. Humans, preferably with a little radiation damage, were to be captured and sent to the vats. There they were dipped in something called FEV, which transformed them into the large, grotesque mutants. I had to find these vats and put them out of action as well, lest another take the master's place and continue to build the mutant army. Fortunately, my friends at the Brotherhood had a few clues and helped me reach my goal. Invading the vats, I came across more mutants and robots. None could stand in my way. I had a mission. I had a goal. I had a really large gun. It was here that Dogmeat fell, a victim of a powerful energy force field. I miss that dog. I destroyed the vats that day, and with it, the mutant army. The last I heard, they splintered and disappeared into the desert. Chapter 7 My Return to Vault 13 I was not treated to a hero's welcome when I returned to Vault 13. The overseer met me outside the massive vault door and told me point blank that while my services to the vault will always be remembered, he could no longer trust me or what I had become. He said something along the lines that I had saved the vault and now I must leave. Bastard. And so I left. The days and weeks that followed were hard on me. I had met few true friends outside the vault, and they had died following me. Now, my family had kicked me out and said that I could never return. I screamed. I cried. Slowly, I came to realize that the Overseer may have been correct. I had changed. Life outside the vault was different, and now I, too, was different. But I have never forgiven him for doing what he did to me. I wandered the desert, but never moved far from the mountains that shielded the vault from the rest of the world. Perhaps I wanted to return and force my way in, or plead for them to take me back. Fortunately, it did not come to that. I found a few wretched souls, a small group of vault dwellers, who, upon hearing of what happened to me, had decided to leave the vault and join my side. They knew little of the outside world and would have died if it were not for my assistance. Together, our little group moved north, away from the vault, and away from that old life. Slowly, I taught them what experience had taught me, and together we learned to thrive. Chapter 8 The Tribe Over time, our ragtag group turned into a tribe. I fell in love with one of them, and we raised a family, like all of our tribe's people. We founded the village beyond the Great Cliff. It is a secure home thanks to our hard work. We would send scouts back towards the vault to help others who thought like ourselves, but that slowly came to an end. We no longer head in that direction. I often wonder what became of Vault 13 and the other vaults, but I never had time to go exploring again. I taught the others the skills they would need to survive and grow strong. Hunting, farming, and other skills to feed us. Engineering and science to build our homes. Fighting to protect what's ours. My love and I led the village and the tribe. The tribe grew and grew strong with our help, but all things come to an end. Our sons and daughters are now the leaders. I'm sure that the tribe will continue to grow strong under the leadership of our children. My love perished years ago, and not a day goes by that I do not think of Pat's face. I see it every time I look at our children. This journal is our legacy to them, to their children, and to the rest of the tribe. That is my story, and I'm sticking to it. The Wanderer. And so we learn a number of sad facts about the canonical story of Fallout 1. Both Ian and Dogmeat are dead. We didn't learn anything about Tycho or Katja, so I suppose we can only hope that they somehow lived. There is one final relic of Arroyo, written by the children of the Vault Dweller. It starts in the year 2177, ten years after the construction of Arroyo, one year before the Institute on the opposite side of the continent begins its research with FEV, and continues to the year 2241, the very year the Chosen One leaves Arroyo. 
This relic is called the Book of Elders, and it appears in the Fallout 2 official strategy guide in pieces as chapter introductions. The Book of Elders is filled with practical advice and then ends with a plea to the Chosen One. We'll finish off this video by reading the Book of Elders. 62nd Season, 2177. Those that travel the desert speak of the wondrous and bizarre creatures and events that they encounter. Some of these chance meetings are commonplace amongst travelers, while others are rare enough to be discussed in hushed whispers around the evening fires for years to come. One thing is certain, that the nature of the wastes is as ever-changing as the sands themselves. However, these fairy stories are simply too fantastic to be believed. 83rd Season, 2183 some say that our people came from the sea, and that the sea kept us safe when the great fires roamed the winds. I don't know how much truth there is in this, but I do know that the great salt is a strong lure to humankind. The ocean seems to reach out with watery tendrils to draw creatures into its bosom. Too many travel the sands along the edge of the large water. The Vault Dweller was the one who selected the location of our village, behind a large dry valley. The surrounding lands are barren and of little interest to the casual traveler. Often, the best way to remain safe is to be in a place that excites little interest in the eyes of others. 83rd Season, 2183 Many places left to us from the before times hold objects that, while once common enough, are now quite rare. Some of these rarities are of unusual beauty and usefulness. However, other places hold only the legacy of violence and death. These areas should be shunned by the wise. The foolish are warned of their hazards. In many cases, it is not always clear what kind of place one has stumbled upon, and in those places of unknown risk, the need for even greater caution is tantamount. 102nd Season, 2188 People beyond the Great Bridge, which separates our village from the world, seem to find immense satisfaction in collecting scraps and leavings from the time before the Great Fires. Somehow, this link to the past gives them comfort. Our tribe is different, in that we gain our happiness from foregoing new beginnings, and we gain our security in relying upon our abilities rather than the artifacts from a time gone by. However, for all of that, to travel the wastes, one must adopt to some degree the ways and objects of those who make their homes there. The things of the before times may poison your soul if you rely upon them, but because they will help you survive, they are needed. 123rd Season, 2193 I have noticed that those of our tribe who would travel beyond the great bridge of our village share similar qualities. They seek paths beyond the trails trodden from village to pasture and to field and back. More than that, those restless souls that survive and return to us seem to have an inner focus that gives them strength in time of need. This focus, I'm convinced, is what separates those who return to us from those who return only to the bosom of our ancestors. 152nd Season, 2200. In small communities such as our village, neighbors know one another and share a sense of responsibility for the common good. It seems that the more people who accumulate in an area, the greater the tendency is for those people to become fractious and prone to violence. No greater proof of this tendency is needed than the glowing craters that now exist where once overcrowded cities stood. Beware of too great a concentration of people in any one place. It makes us more dangerous to one another than ever. 157th Season, 2201 Know that our tribe is not alone in the wastes. Many strange and dangerous creatures live just beyond the Great Bridge. Some, although of unusual visage, are friendly to our kind, but most are best treated with caution. If you travel the wastes, remember the exile of our revered ancestor, who was cast out by his own kind from the vault of the Holy Thirteen. Indeed, many of the fearsome creatures almost defy description, but the most monstrous by far, and the most dangerous, is man. 224th Season, 2218 
Many of our people listen to the traveling merchants as they spin fantastic tales of entire cities still as large as those from the before times. As though these wanderers had not already stretched the bounds of credulity far enough, they go on to tell those who would listen that these cities are filled not with people, but with strange creatures that barely resemble us. They say also that these creatures were once men, but are no longer. Instead, they're cursed to spend their entire years as monstrous creatures. Strange are the things that I have seen, and true enough is humankind's self-brought curse of radiation. 229th season, 2219. The tools of destruction were too heavily relied upon in the before times. Fascination with the wares of death's pleasure must have consumed our forefathers, judging from the destruction they wrought upon one another and our home. The nature of mankind has not changed so much since then that weapons are unnecessary. I, however, hope that our people continue to find more utility in the tools of life, rather than the instruments of death. I have heard tales that some are trying to resurrect the past. Not only do they seek to reclaim lost technology, they also seek to reclaim lost ways. I fear following in the footsteps of the past. I fear that the ways that we dealt with our problems and one another in the past did not lead humanity to a better end. Some of the paths these people follow would best remain lost. I am afraid of reviving too much of what was. 250th Season, 2224. Our young hunters and warriors have much to learn about the world around them. The wastes are vast and unforgiving. Teaching will give our young ones knowledge, if they heed my tired words, but only time will give them wisdom. I pray that the spirits give them the time they need. 272nd Season, 2230. Most of our village's hunters wend their way through the trackless wastes by following the wind, sun, and stars. Others swear they can find their way by watching the movements of animals and insects, but there are few, all too few, who increase our tribe's understanding of the world for future generations. The maps that our hunters and traders have created are just as much part of our tribe's wealth as the hides of the prized golden geckos upon which the maps are painstakingly drawn. 316th Season, 2240 one can save us. The call of the Vault Dweller's blood must run strong enough in one who would reveal themselves as the Chosen One. Far and far must the Chosen travel to save our people. New, built on the bones of the old, conceals our future as well as our past. Only the One can bring the Spirit of Plenty back to our tribe. Only the One can sift the prize from the grip of the Dead Sands. The Chosen must bring our salvation, or we will surely perish. 322nd Season, 2241 Truly, you are the Chosen One. It is to you that we turn to as Arroyo, our village, our home, faces its hour of greatest need. In all the years since our ancestor, the Vault Dweller, founded Arroyo, our people have known hardship many times. But never before has our village suffered so long a period of trial. The wells are almost dry, crops wither in the fields, the old and the young alike sicken, and our Brahmin are dying. We have one hope, Chosen One, an object spoken of in the sacred text of our ancestor. It is the birthright of our people, the Garden of Eden creation kit, the wondrous Gek. Only that can save us now. Listen, Chosen, and I will tell you a tale of your people, that you may learn the promise of the Gek. When your ancestor was cast from the Vault of the Holy Thirteen over eighty years ago, he and others who had escaped the tyranny of the Vault of the Holy Thirteen traveled north. For months they journeyed through the beast-haunted radioactive wastes left from the great burn of the before times to distance themselves from the Vault. Finally, they came to a fertile valley nestled behind a deep gorge, our Arroyo. Here they settled, and our people prospered on this land. The Vault of the Holy Thirteen, which your people had left behind, was remembered only in the shrine of your ancestor. The Vault Suit, the Holy Vault Dweller's Survival Guide, and other sacred artifacts were nearly forgotten, but for festival days. Now, though, things are different. Your people suffer, and the elders have turned to the Holy Vault Dweller's Survival Guide for help in these dark times. 
The sacred text mentions the Garden of Eden creation kit, an amazing device from the before times that can turn any land into an earthly paradise. We cannot last much longer without the salvation that the Gek promises. Although the Holy Thirteen abandoned our ancestor, they cannot turn their backs on us now. You shall wear the mystic vault suit of our ancestor with the Holy Thirteen emblazoned upon it so that they will recognize you as the rightful heir to the promise of the Gek. You must travel the wastes to find the vault of the Holy Thirteen and then demand the Gek. This is the only way our people may yet be saved. I believe in you, Chosen One. However, others need evidence of your worthiness to be our emissary to the Holy Thirteen. You must brave the Temple of Trials to prove yourself to those who would question my choice of you as our savior. I have no doubt that you will show yourself to be a worthy champion for our village. Once you pass the Temple of Trials, you will need wisdom that only experience can give you. There is no time for you to learn all that you need to know on your own, so I will give you what help that I can. I have read the Holy Vault Dweller's Survival Guide, as well as other tomes saved from the fires of the before times. Our village's own record, the Book of Elders, also contains great wisdom. When our people's wisdom may help you, I will offer it. Our ancestors and I will guide you as best we can. Fear not, Chosen One. The strength of the Vault Dweller runs strong in your veins. I know that you shall not fail us. Your quest begins. With that, the Chosen One enters the Temple of Trials, and the full story of Fallout 2 commences. What are your thoughts on the Vault Dweller's memoirs and the Book of the Elders? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still believe you're not getting YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.